सर इट इज विजिबल नाउ सर Sir, uh, please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, now it is visible, sir. <clears throat> oh. Hmm. Let me try one more time. Yes. Yes. Now, do you see my screen? Yes, sir. Do you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. It was visible, and just. Do you see my slides? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, but this is all. God knows what is happening. No, sir. Uh, just uh, select the presentation mode, and it will be okay, sir. No, it is already in presentation mode. Oh. This is like so many of them. Stop presenting. Let me just try one more time. Oh. Okay. All right. I think you can see it now. Okay. Yes, sir. It is visible, yes. Yes. Okay, sir. You can continue now. You can see the slide, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Not, visible, okay. sir. So, not this one. I don't know how this is open. Uh, do you see my slides now making the making of the indian rotavirus vaccine no sir not not not, not it will not not now not How is it now? Yes. Okay. Yes, finally, we're there. Sorry about all this uh, mess, but uh, let's hope that um, we don't have a difficulty any further. So, as I said, that I'm going to talk about this uh, rare uh, success story where an observation from a hospital bed led to development of a vaccine, and that vaccine is currently uh, being used extensively not only in, in India but several countries outside India. This is just a cartoon to uh, to show that in life of a biological scientists, many a times a situation comes when they think that they have a solution to a medical problem. And we have patients on the other side of this cliff waiting for that solution. But for that discovery from the scientist lab to reach the patient, it has to travel through a difficult path and we call it uh, crossing the valley of death because a lot of these ideas that our scientists generate in the lab, they never see the light of the day, they never reach the patient. 
Now, in last decade or so, a new uh, field of science has emerged that we called uh, uh, translational um, translational health science. Slide is still visible, or there is a problem? No, sir. It is visible now. Okay. It's okay, sir. So, uh, a, a new um, science has emerged that called translational medicine, basically that is turning basic research into medicines and treatments. Now, this is not moving. Let's see. Okay, so that's called translational research, where you convert your scientific discovery into a useful medical uh, product. But uh, how uh, successful is translational research? Actually, the odds of success are not very high. It's only about 5% of the time you have a chance of uh, succeeding. And that is based on um, you know, a paper published in American Journal of Medicine in 2003, where the authors um, you know, cataloged some 101 discoveries that uh, you know, concluded in their uh, findings that they have a uh, they might have a solution for a medical treatment. But by 2002, only five had received the license for clinical use. So out of 101 discoveries, uh, almost uh, 19 or 20 years later, only five had received the license for clinical use. And even when the idea uh, gets translated, it takes a long time. From the same general report, they uh, concluded from patent to product, it takes anywhere between 14 to 44 years, the median being 24 years. Vaccine development timelines are you know, also pretty long because it has to go through several stages of preclinical testing, then clinical testing, and then regulatory approval is provided. So preclinical testing is generally done in the laboratory situation in the animal models which takes anywhere between four to five years. Once you are successful, you get a regulatory permission to conduct clinical trials. And in the phase one trial, you have to establish safety of your vaccine in a small number of uh, human beings, which could be anywhere between 20 to 100. It could take anywhere between two to three years. And if you are able to demonstrate safety of your product, you are allowed to test more than one dose of your vaccine. So you generally have to test two or three doses of the vaccine. And you are allowed to take a bigger number of individual in your trial, which is anywhere between 100 to 300. And this is called phase two trial, which takes again three to four years. And if you are successful in demonstrating your immunogenicity and a dose that will be safe and immunogenic, then you are allowed to conduct phase three trial that takes place in several thousand uh, individuals. It is multicentric and it takes anywhere between four to five years. That's called phase three trial. The whole process from preclinical testing to phase three trial takes anywhere between 15 to 20 years. And if you are lucky and if you are successful uh, demonstrating the safety and efficacy of your vaccine is phase three trial, you are given the permission to market the uh, vaccine. Even when it is being marketed, uh, you have to, um, you know, keep watching for long-term safety of your product, which is called phase four. And there have been examples where vaccines have gone through all, you know, three phases of trial have been permitted to be used in the, uh, you know, market. But during phase four, there were safety issues and had to be withdrawn. So the vaccine development process is long it takes anywhere between 15 to 20 years it's risky because only few vaccines reach phase three and some of them can even fail after that and it's complex it requires multiple expertise team of experts coordination between activities production field laboratory so it's a very complex process so translational research for vaccine development is 
a team game. As I said, that you require various kind of team. You require scientists. You need biotechnologists. You need product development specialists. You need clinicians, statisticians, public health specialists, population biologists, and social scientists. The Indian rotavirus vaccine development team uh, leads. I have listed them over here. We had Professor M K Bhan, who was the clinician at AIMS, who made uh, the initial observation. Then we had the clinical experts Nita Bhandari, Gagandeep Kang, Ashish Baudeka, who were involved in uh, clinical trials of the vaccine. Roger Glass from CDC USA was a public health expert. Harry Greenberg was a virologist. C Durga Rao from IISC was also a virologist. And me and my team from NII and then at THSTI as immunologists and virologists developing assays for establishing the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So let me give you a quick, uh, uh, you know, introduction of uh, rotavirus. This is a virus which was discovered in humans in 1973 by Ruth Bishop and her colleagues in Australia. This is a wheel-shaped virus uh, and the particles can be seen in the biopsies from infants with severe gastroenteritis. So you see this virus, this is a decorated uh, virus. This is actually uh, a cartoon created uh, you know, in computer, but the top picture shows the electron microscopic picture of rotavirus. This is a non-enveloped triple layered virus, which is got icosahedron capsid. It's about 75 nanometer in diameter. There are five zero groups of rotavirus, A, B, C, D, and E. And actually for this audience, it would suffice to understand that there are rotaviruses that can infect humans as well as animals. So what would that uh, create a situation that a virus which is infecting humans as well as animals uh, there could be evolution of uh, viruses which are animal viruses primarily but then they can infect humans and vice versa. The genome of virus has 11 double-stranded RNA segments which code for 12 proteins. The two most important proteins of the virus are found on the outer surface. One of them is called VP4, which is involved in virus entry. And the another is called VP7, which is the major coat protein of the virus particle and therefore is highly immunogenic. And both VP4 and VP7 are therefore very important from the point of view of vaccine development. Now, VP7 is the glycoprotein, as I told you, which forms the uh, you know, outer layer of the uh, virion particle. And there are 16 different gene sequences for VP7 gene. VP7 is denoted as, as a G type. So there are, you know, anyway, uh, they are called G1, G2, G3, G4, G8, etc. There are 16 different kinds. VP4 protein, as I told you, is also involved in uh, entry and is very important from vaccine point of view. There are 28 different genotypes of VP4. And a combination of these VP7 and VP4 can define the serotype of the virus. There are four to five rotavirus genotypes that are common worldwide. These are defined as G and P types. So G1P8 is a virus that has got, that has got uh, VP7 protein of G1 type and VP4 protein of P8 type. That combination is the most common, 52% of them. And then next, most common is um, <clears throat> G2P4, G4P8, and several others are found. Now, how does uh, rotavirus uh, cause disease? Rotavirus is transmitted through fecooral route. It enters uh, small intestine. It sticks to glycolipids on the villous cells of which form the lining of a small intestine. It invades the villous tip cells, causing atrophy loss of digestive enzymes and a dip in absorption. Once the villi become blunted, the resulting malabsorption of carbohydrates results in diarrhea. 
Protavirus is the leading cause of severe gastroenteritis in children less than five years of age. Actually, about 30% of all serious uh, acute gastroenteritis cases are due to rotavirus. Rotavirus causes diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration, and in extreme situation, it can cause shock and death in uh, infants. Rotavirus accounts for approximately one third of the nearly 600,000 global child deaths attributable to diarrhea. So almost 200,000 deaths are because of uh, rotavirus across the world. And 95% of these deaths occur in developing countries because of our <coughs> poor hygienic conditions. If you look at the prevalence of rotaviral deaths across the world, you can see these countries which are dotted. And each dot represents about 2,000 deaths each year. And you can see India is full of these dots. So India, you know, almost had 100,000 deaths each year. Uh, because of uh, rotaviral infection. Now, rotavirus disease cannot be treated with antibiotics. As you would know that only uh, bacterial infections can be treated by antibiotics, not the viral infection, and there is no antiviral drug available to treat rotaviral infections. Most children are at risk of infection in developing countries because of poor hygienic conditions. Therefore, vaccination offers the best hope for preventing severe rotavirus illness. And that is indicated over here in this figure. This shows the number of rotavirus cases in pediatric referral hospitals in Ghana and African countries. And so the numbers used to be as high as 50 per month uh, before the vaccination started. This green line shows the time of vaccination and after the vaccination, you can see the number has dropped to about 10 or less. So vaccination therefore is highly efficacious. How is the rotavirus vaccine prepared? A Jennerian approach was taken. Jenner was the uh, father or Jenner is regarded as father of vaccination. Uh, what is done over here, <clears throat> Jenner generated the first ever known vaccine, that is the smallpox vaccine. And this was based on a live attenuated virus, which was similar to the smallpox virus that causes the disease. So he would not use a smallpox virus, which would cause the disease, but he used a cowpox virus, which would cause only mild disease and fever in people. But he found that it protected them against smallpox. That is how Jenner developed the first vaccine. So similar approach has taken the first rotavirus vaccine. The brand name was Rota Shield. It was licensed in US in 1998. It was a live attenuated virus vaccine produced by Wyeth. But this vaccine had gone through all the clinical development stages from phase one to phase three. But when the vaccine was used in large scale in the children in field, it was found that it was causing intersusception in uh, you know, one child in 10,000 vaccinated infants. Intersusception is basically telescopic folding of a small intestine that can lead to uh, you know, perforation, edema, and in severe cases, this can result in death. So a vaccine that was found to be safe and effective, eventually when allowed to be used in, in field, in phase four, it was found to cause unacceptable uh, disease of intersusception and therefore had to be withdrawn. Now, as I told you, the vaccine had all gone through all these phases, preclinical testing, phase one, phase two, and phase three, was allowed to be used. And then in phase four, the vaccine had to be withdrawn because of the safety issues, because safety is very important from uh, you know immunization point of view. Then in 2006, two more vaccines appeared in the market. One was Rotarix by uh, GSK Pharma. This is an American uh, company. And another American company made Rotatech vaccine. This time, these vaccines were tested in 60 to 70,000 infants. The large number of infants were tested in phase three trials so that if there's any risk of intersusception, they would be able to figure this out this time. 
they found that there was no increased risk of interception or there was no serious adverse events. Vaccine efficacy was found 85 to 98 percent against severe disease. So the vaccines were highly efficacious. In 2009, therefore, WHO recommended that rotavirus may be uh, rotavirus vaccine may be included in um, national immunization programs across the world. Now, as I said, this vaccine had 85 to 98 percent efficacy against severe disease. This vaccine, these vaccines were tested in Europe and USA. But when these vaccines were tested in developing countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, or in African countries such as Ghana, Mali, Kenya, etc., they found that vaccine efficacy was anywhere between 50 to 60 percent. Now, this was not unusual. This was generally anticipated because oral vaccines have been in the past less immunogenic in developing countries than in the developed countries. And there have been examples of cholera vaccine or OPV, which were found to be less immunogenic in these countries than in the developed world. Now, why oral vaccines are less immunogenic in uh, you know, developing countries or poor uh, or resource poor countries? There are several uh, factors and one you know, explanation that has been given at times is that mothers are breastfeeding their infants in you know, these uh, countries. And when you give a live viral vaccine orally, the kids start crying and mothers start feeding them. And mother's milk has a lot of antibodies to several viruses, including the rotavirus, which will neutralize the vaccine and therefore will compromise on the vaccine efficacy. There are other uh, issues related to malnutrition, all you know, continuous infection of the gut uh, with microbes and viruses because of our unhygienic conditions, all of these factors can give rise to a reduced immune responses. Therefore, we premise that if a vaccine is made from an Indian virus that establishes well under the conditions of breastfeeding, it could make a highly effective vaccine for developing countries. Now, this all started with an observation at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi in 1985, where they found that there was a silent outbreak of rotavirus infection that was going on in the newborn unit. What they found that 50% of the infants that got born there got infected within three days and 75% got infected by one week. They identified a virus. The strain was given the name 116E. And they found that this was a recombinant between human and bovine virus of the G9P11 genotype. If you remember, this is not one of the common genotype of rotavirus. What was also interesting, they found that if you follow up these kids who got infected with this virus, they never developed clinical symptoms of diarrhea, etc. At the time they were uh, infected with this virus. But if you, if they, and when they were followed up for next two years, they found that these kids show, showed fewer episodes or milder episodes of rotaviral diarrhea, giving an indication that infection with 116E virus was leading to vaccine effect, was generating protective immune responses, and therefore these kids were protected against any future infection with rotavirus. A similar observation was made in IIC Bangalore, but they isolated a different virus, which was a bovine human reassortant. So it was a bovine virus with some human genes. The previous virus was a human virus with a bovine gene. And the Bangalore virus had the genotype G10P11. And similarly, when the kids were followed up for two years, they showed uh, remarkable protection against future rotaviral infections. So this is what the genotype of uh, you know 116C virus or I321 virus that was isolated from Bangalore looked like. 116C had all the genes of human virus except this VP4 
And if you remember, I said that VP4 is an important protein that is involved in virus uptake inside the cell. Whereas I321 had all the bovine viral genes except for human genes for NSP1 and NSP3. But it also had the same bovine gene for VP4 protein. So, you know why we thought that both these virus had vaccine potential? There were several reasons. Both strains colonized the infant gut extremely well. And we reasoned that it might be because the maternal antibodies might not be able to neutralize these viruses because they had this protein from bovine or animal uh, viruses for which immune responses will not be there in humans and therefore the mother's milk might not have antibody to this. These viruses cause no apparent disease, clinical symptoms and both provided protection against disease after reinfection. Based on these premise, the vaccine uh, was prepared by growing the virus in cell culture. Several different cell lines were used, MA104 and then um, AGMK cells, etc. And finally, a vaccine lot was prepared, which was tested in the US uh, at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. This was in 1996. Now, when you are testing a vaccine, you are never allowed to test the vaccine on children, let alone infants, unless you have demonstrated safety of the vaccine first in adults, then in children, or the grown-up children, then younger children, and finally in the infants. So this vaccine was tested in uh, you know adults, 30 adults in US, and it was demonstrated to be safe. Then it was tested in 30 children of the age of 2 to 12 years. Again, it was demonstrated to be safe. And based on this, uh, the study was shifted to India, where the vaccine was tested again in adult and children at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. In the same sequence, first in adults, you demonstrate safety. Then you demonstrate safety of the vaccine in children. And only after that, you are given uh, uh, you know, uh, permission to work with infants for whom this vaccine was being made. Now, as I said, that vaccine, after having demonstrated safety in, in adults and children, we tested the vaccine in infants of the age of 8 to 12 weeks at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. We tested a single dose of vaccine that is 10 to the power 5 focus forming units of FFU and this was a frozen vaccine which was frozen at minus 70 degrees centigrade. 90 kids were randomized in three groups of 30 each. One group received 116E vaccine, one group received I321 vaccine and the third group received placebo. So placebo, there is no vaccine there. It just looks like vaccine so nobody knows whether they are receiving vaccine or placebo. And the placebo is given so that there is no bias from our side. So we can compare what happens in placebo. Are we doing anything better than placebo using a vaccine or not? What was found that there was no significant difference in the number of adverse events. So adverse events were same as in the placebo. Diarrhea was reported in five kids which were immunized with 116C virus, eight kids which were immunized with I321, and three kids which were given the placebo. So there was no statistical difference there or I, either. Zero conversion rate was 73% for 116E, 39% for I321, and 20% for placebo. So again, this gave us some indication that 116E was superior in terms of generating the immune response compared to I321. And based on this, it was decided that we will work on 116E vaccine because working with two vaccines was going to be a very expensive affair. As you will see, the phase three trials are very, very expensive. At this stage, we shifted the vaccine production to Bharat Biotech in Hyderabad. We pro produced the vaccine grown in Vero cells, which is the only cell line permitted for producing vaccine for human use. So Bharat Biotech produced 116C vaccine 
and since this vaccine was a different lot of vaccine than the previous vaccine which was produced in USA, we had to conduct phase one and phase two trial again to demonstrate safety. But since we had already demonstrated safety and immunogenicity of a similar product before, we were given option to also test it in two dose vaccine as two doses in one go. So we were testing the safety and immunogenicity of two doses of vaccine, 10 to power 5 and 10 to power 5 FFU. We were allowed to only take healthy, non-malnourished infants. Okay. So first you established that there are no malnourished infants in your study group. And then only we were allowed this study and we were allowed to do this study in 90 children. We, of course, were looking for safety. And then you, know, you can see there were several parameters for safety. And initially, you were allowed to take only the lower dose of the vaccine, that is 10 to power 4, demonstrate safety of 10 to power 4. Only when your vaccine at lower dose is found to be safe, you are allowed to go for a higher dose of the vaccine, that is 10 to power 5. And again, we demonstrated safety of the 10 to power 5 dose of the vaccine. Now, the next objective was to establish the immunogenicity of the vaccine and what we found that vaccine at higher dose was much more immunogenic 89.7 percent kids zero converted compared to lower dose of the vaccine at 62 percent now obviously you have to find a fine balance between the dose and the immunogenicity because if you are going to use higher dose of the vaccine the production cost would be higher but if you use lower dose of the vaccine, the immunization coverage or the immunogenicity is lower and therefore it may not provide the desired results. So finally, we chose a 10 power 5 dose of the vaccine because it was found to be more immunogenic. Now, just because vaccine was safe and vaccine was giving immune responses, this was a proxy for efficacy. But this does not demonstrate any efficacy for the vaccine. And you must demonstrate the efficacy of vaccine before the vaccine can be allowed to be used in large number of children. Therefore, phase three efficacy trial is desirable. And here we carried out randomized double blind placebo control. So all the kids who will receive the vaccine or placebo, they will be you know, the investigators will be blinded. Investigators will not know which child is receiving which vaccine. We were allowed to test the vaccine in infants. And this time, since this was a phase three trial, we were not required to select only the healthy children. We were allowed to work on randomly chosen infants in a given population. This was a due lot of vaccine that Bharat Biotech produced, which was again a frozen vaccine at minus 20 degrees centigrade. The study was conducted in 6,800 infants at three different sites in Delhi, in Pune, and in Velour. Vaccine or the placebo dose was given at six weeks, 10 weeks, and 14 weeks of age. And we followed up these kids for two years to see whether there was any unwanted complication or did they develop any rotaviral diarrhea in the next two years? Or were they protected against rotaviral diarrhea? After, you know, four year long study, we published this article in Lancet in 2014 that demonstrated the efficacy of 116C rotavirus vaccine in Indian infants. Now, when you say efficacy of vaccine, you can calculate the vaccine efficacy in terms of percent protection against severe rotaviral gastroenteritis. And what we found that our vaccine was 56% effective in preventing severe rotaviral diarrhea. Now, if you remember, Rotatec and Rotarex had efficacy of almost 90% in the European population, but in, in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, in Africa, its efficacy was between 50 and 60 percent. So we were hoping that our vaccine, since it is made using an Indian virus, we should have a higher vaccine efficacy. But unfortunately, the vaccine efficacy was again 56 percent, which was lower. 
Nevertheless, it was safe. And even with 56% vaccine efficacy, we calculated that we will save, uh, you know, like almost 60,000 lives or 60,000 children each year from death. Because I, I to, you remember, I, I told you there were 100,000 deaths of children each year uh, in this country. So in 2014, <clears throat> January, Bharat Biotech received manufacturing and marketing license from Indian regulatory agency. In 2015, Prime Minister launched the rotavirus vaccine. In 2016, the rotavirus vaccine was allowed to be used in Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha. Having demonstrated the safety of the vaccine in these four states, we were then allowed in 2017 to use the vaccine in Assam, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Tripura, and Tamil Nadu. In 2018, we received WHO's approval for this Indian made rotavirus vaccine that enabled the company to sell this vaccine to United Nations agencies and Gavi, the vaccine alliance for use in low resource countries. Subsequently, in 2019, <clears throat> rotavirus vaccine was launched under the universal immunization program in India. That means all states of India would receive rotavirus vaccine by September 2019. You can see now these are the various vaccines that are given to infants uh, that include tuberculosis, polio, hepatitis B, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria. Now rotavirus vaccine is also included there. So this is an unusual long story starting in 1985 and culminating somewhere you know, in uh, 2019 in a vaccine that was given to children across the country. It has gone through several ups and downs. It started with an observation in 1985 in clinic, then 1988 virus was isolated in a laboratory. And then it had undergone, you know, several studies uh, uh, that included the production of vaccine load, then testing in phase one, phase two, and phase three trial. And after demonstrating phase three trial, it has reached the field in 2018. So here's uh, you know, a, an example where observation made by scientists and the clinicians at this end, we were able to deliver the product to patient sitting on the other end. This work, uh, I started um, at National Institute of Immunology. Then, uh, as was told during my introduction, I moved to translational health science and technology, where we conducted phase three trial of the vaccine. And right now, I work at Regional Center for Biotechnology. Numerous people participated in uh, this study. So if I have to acknowledge there would be a uh, you know, very large number of people. But I decided to just put the list of uh, actually the authors of the Lancet paper that we published in 2014, demonstrating the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And even over here, I think there are more than 60 or 70 authors on this paper uh, who have contributed uh, to this work uh, at different levels. I think I'll stop here and uh, I will be happy to take any questions from your students or faculty. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk that uh, also include the glorious scientific research work that are continuing in our beloved nation. So now, boys, it is open for you. So is the question answer session now. So if you have any question in your mind, you can unmute yourself and you can ask that, that question to our respected sir. Sir, uh, please, please, told... tell your, please tell your name and the semester and after that you can ask your question. Sir, my name is Devayan Ghosh, uh, semester one, Zulaji Anas. Uh, you told that the development of a vaccine takes uh, nearly five to six years, but uh, how the COVID-19 virus vaccine develops so quickly? 
very interesting question you know this is another unusual uh, scenario because there was no time to wait there were a lot of uh, you you would have heard in newspaper that there were a lot of shortcuts the studies were shortened fewer number of people were you know uh, allowed to be tested it was a desperate situation and therefore uh, you know a lot of uh, these studies were compressed and uh, i think it took uh, nine or ten months really to to produce the vaccine uh, even our uh, you know because you know data is reviewed very very carefully by uh, regulatory agencies at each step and during the covid vaccine uh, production data was being reviewed as it was being generated and there was a time when you know if the vaccine trial stopped yesterday today the data was submitted to the regulatory agencies and tomorrow it was getting reviewed that has not been the case generally for all other vaccines you do trial for 3 years that you collate your data you work for a year for analyzing data then you submit it to the regulatory agencies they take another year to review your data so everything just just slows down but this covid vaccine has given us uh, confidence and uh, you know opportunity to cut down on the timelines and i guess in future the vaccine development might not take you know 10 to 15 years they may i mean they may not be produced in 10 months as was the case with the you know covid vaccine but uh, realistically you know 5 to 6 years uh, what could really compress uh, to make a um, you know case for making a, a vaccine next so uh, next one by one and before uh, the next question one announcement for the boys for you uh, uh, one feedback form is given in the chat box so please fill up those feedback form also so uh, please uh, raise your hand and ask the question Shohan or Suraj who already have uh, raised their hand please ask the question sir uh, you have told about the aims delhi report uh, that the children uh, which are uh, from uh, 3 to 4 weeks they do uh, they don't have so much symptoms so uh, does it indicates any mutation of the rotavirus or another character in the particular indian citizens no so you know you always have uh, mutant viruses this is rna virus and obviously uh, it was a recombinated naturally by the combination of animal and human virus. Now this virus, while it was able to infect children, but it was not causing them, you know, any clinical symptoms of diarrhea or fever or anything. It was a random chance of isolating the virus in the process of, uh, you know, the research that was going on in the in in that department they were isolating viruses randomly and they ended up uh, isolating this virus they said that all these kids were normal how come uh, there is this virus and they found that repeatedly they were able to isolate this virus from large number of kids in their uh, uh, you know um, uh, hospital ward and they found that kids were uh, doing fine so that is when they thought that maybe this could be a useful virus to make a vaccine. That is how we got on to uh, making this vaccine. Over. And sir, what does it mean Next. by zero groups? Sir, it is Ms. Suraj Mondal from first semester. Another question from me that what does it mean by zero groups? Any other question? Anybody has a question? I don't see any more raised hands now. Boys, any uh, anybody of you have any questions? Boys, you can ask. Sir, I have asked a question. Uh, uh, that can what you does hear it me? mean? Hello. 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 Sir, uh, am I clear to you, sir? Hello. Yes. 
Yes, Suraj, now you ask once more your question. You ask your question once more, Suraj. The Suraj had question on uh, the, the virus that was isolated, right? Suraj, you may, yes. you may ask again, 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 again ask the question. Sir, I am Suraj Mondal from first semester Geology Honors. Sir, I have a question that uh, what does it mean by zero groups of rotavirus? Okay, so you know, I told you there are uh, there are different VP4 and there are different VP7 genes. Okay, yeah. these are the proteins uh, against which antibodies are generated in uh, children who get infected. Now, I told you there are a large number of these proteins, 16 and 28 of uh, different kinds. So, a combination of these can produce different uh, viruses and they will produce antibodies of different kinds so we call them different zero groups and zero types of uh, the virus where uh, you know antibodies produced against one virus cannot efficiently neutralize another group of virus they, these are the called uh, zero types okay Next question. Looks like there are no more questions now. So, uh, as there is no more question, again, I'm extending my thanks to Sudhangshu sir. So now I am asking our principal Maharaj Sami Kamalastanandaji for a few keywords. Principal Maharaj, sir. So, very nice uh, presentation. Of, uh, uh, sir, very nicely he presented the rotavirus and how, especially, the journey of uh, the development of any vaccine and uh, how it is uh, so challenging and so uh, enthralling in all steps. He mentioned uh, all this, and I think from the student can understand not only rotavirus but any type of development, yes, uh, such type of gel and such type of uh, uh, this type of thrilling attitude, which actually gives uh, and also some interact very nicely with the student. And uh, I also request uh, that I contact with you in future when you come Kolkata. I always contact you. I uh, arrange your invite, uh, just uh, arrange your visit in our college and, and uh, students and faculty are very eager to uh, talk with you face to face because this online platform, so many limitations are there and uh, we cannot get an actual paper <laughs> if you come and we arrange your visit and uh, I think all students and faculty will enlist through your this uh, wisdom and uh, suggestion. Well, Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Saab. Uh, it will be a pleasure to visit you. I will let you know when I happen yes. to be in Calcutta next time. I'll be very yes. happy to visit. Yes. So we close yes. So, thank you, Principal Maharaj. So, is a time for vote of thanks for that. I may request uh, our Vice Principal Maharaj, Sami Vedanandaji, for the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. So, we had a really enriching session from Dr. Sudhamshu Prati, sir. So, he has been very lucid and detailed in his approach to elucidate his long journey, his struggles, and his, it only represents that how much patience and perseverance is required in science and research. So, that is what from right from 1985 to 2019, the long journey which Sir has described. So this is really a very befitting talk for our newcomer students. They have just started their journey. So you must remember that this is just the start of your journey and the road is quite long. You have to travel through it with lots of patience, with effort, constant alertness, and updation. Updation is very much required. As you have seen that Sir has moved from one in uh, research arena from one to another. 
and he has completely updated himself so nicely so we are really indebted to you sir for your wonderful talk and inspirations to our newcomer students and on behalf of ramakrishna mission vivekananda centenary college rahara kolkata i extend my heartfelt gratitude to vrati sir and i express my namaskars to you sir and i thank all the teachers and students who have assembled here and hope that there will be a take away message that from today itself you have to start your journey of uh, this type of endurance and this type of constant hard work and of course that will pay some day as it has happened with sir sir sirota virus vaccine which has a long history and wonderfully sir has described his um, step by step progressions so thank you very much sir and we are looking forward to meet you again in future thank you sir namaste thank you very much we will now disconnect thank you thank you sir. স্যার বলছিলাম যে ওই যে ফিডব্যাক ফর্ম আছে ওখানে সেমিস্টার বলে অপশন 1 আছে ওইটা কি অপশন 1 টা এনেবল করে রাখো রেকর্ডটা বন্ধ করা হয়ে যাবে স্টপ করেছি হ্যাঁ